Friday, February 22, 1918. Down at the harbor in the city of St. John's, Newfoundland, the crew of the SS Florizel prepares the ship for a winter voyage. In 1918, Newfoundland is not yet part of Canada. The British colony is heavily reliant on the fishing and sealing industries, and St. John's is the main economic centre. St. John's is a very active city. The harbour was busy with naval ships, the merchants carrying on with their trade, and of course that was largely what St. John's was built up from, was the, was the trade. Bowering's Red Cross line operates a number of ships that cater to international trade. The pride of the shipping company's fleet is the SS Florizel. Built in 1909, it is a steam-powered ship more than 300 feet long and 42 feet wide. Uh, she was strengthened for ice navigation. She was uh, state-of-the-art at the time she was built. The ship was a high-class ship. She had wonderful furnishings, and uh, the food that was available was top quality as well. She was really catering for the merchant class, who had certain expectations of life, of course. Below decks, captain of the Florizel, William Martin, is personally inspecting the ship. He has served aboard the vessel for more than six years. Captain Martin was uh, married with two children living in St. John's. He'd been with the Red Cross Line for quite a while, and he was a very experienced and well-respected uh, captain. He was known to be quite cautious and never really to have run into any, any trouble under his uh, command. Meanwhile, third officer Philip Jackman is on the bridge of the ship. He is busy plotting out the course of the Florizel. The Florizel is scheduled to travel from St. John's to Halifax, then on to New York. Although a familiar route, it is by no means an easy one. The Newfoundland coast has earned the title of Graveyard of the Atlantic as a result of frequent shipwrecks caused by many navigational hazards, especially in winter. There weren't a great number of lights and other navigational aids, but the dangers were many. The weather that was, uh, could often be atrocious, especially in the winter months. But when you add to that the incredibly um, craggy coastline and rocks of Newfoundland, it's a dangerous place to sail. Without radar, the ship must travel close to the Newfoundland coast, navigating visually with the help of lights along the shore. Below decks, Chief Engineer John Reeder is in charge of the engine room. Reeder has more than 25 years' experience he is looking forward to seeing his family when the ship arrives in Halifax. Saturday, February 23rd, 1918. Greg Maloney, a resident of St. John's, takes passage aboard the Florizel. Maloney is headed to Halifax to work in construction. He has no choice but to leave behind his wife Mary, who is pregnant, and their seven children. At that time, there was no, no work here in Newfoundland, very little work. And, you know, you had to go wherever you could get a job. You know, more or less, you had to go to support your family. Alfred Moody is the ship's butcher. He prepares to leave his pregnant wife and two young children for one more trip aboard the Florizel. As Alfred gets ready to leave, his wife and children are planning on moving back to England and leaving Newfoundland behind forever. Uh, after this trip, he was going to take his family, which is his wife and two children, and she was pregnant with a third at that point in time, and they were going back to England to live. Uh, she was getting ready to, to move. Uh, the children were excited about it. John Munn, managing director of the Red Cross Lines, boards the ship and takes stateroom number one, across the hall from his daughter Betty, the youngest passenger on board. She was only three and a half, and um, she was traveling with her nurse, Evelyn Trenchard, and they were on their way south to, uh, to visit uh, her mother, who was not well. As the Florizel prepares for departure, the passengers are informed of the emergency procedures. The passengers would be introduced to the life jackets and instructed how to use them. 
and under what condition, what the signals were that would indicate to them that the ship was in a dangerous situation and they were to muster at the boat stations and with their life jackets. The weather is blustery with a hint of snow and the Toronto Meteorological Society issues a storm warning for the eastern seaboard. You had a winter storm <laughs> certainly once a week. A ship such as the Florizel, they'd be of uh, uncomfortable perhaps, but of no danger. At 7.30 p.m., the Florizel leaves St. John's with 138 people aboard, 78 passengers, including nine women and seven children, along with 60 crew. As the Florizel steams along the coast, the weather conditions worsen. The ship encounters winds in excess of 35 miles per hour and snow reducing visibility. The snow that fell, it would hit the water and it would, it didn't melt. It remained there on the surface as a mush, something in the consistency of porridge. The snow prevents Captain Martin from deploying the log. The log is towed behind the boat and is used by the navigator to show the distance the Florizel has traveled. Without it, there is no way to tell exactly where the ship is. Captain Martin and Philip Jackman have years of experience at sea and feel confident that they can follow their planned course. Evening falls as the Florizel heads out into the Atlantic. Alfred Moody is among the crew cleaning up the kitchen for the night. That probably would have taken them to 9 or 10 o'clock in the evening. Then after that, they, they would have gone to their bunks and tried to get a good night's sleep because they would have been up early the next morning to prepare breakfast. Greg Maloney enjoys the camaraderie in the dining hall and later returns to his second-class berth in the stern of the ship. In the smoking room, another social area near the dining hall, John Munn takes part in the festivities. Meanwhile, in her stateroom below decks, Betty Munn is fast asleep under the watchful eye of her nurse. By midnight, most of the passengers are in bed. Visibility is reduced, and sighting land and navigational lights becomes impossible. At this point, the um, ship was starting to pitch and roll. Uh, things were starting to move around, and windows, the portholes were starting to leak a little bit. The Florizel is at full throttle and would normally be traveling at 10 to 12 knots. Captain Martin notes in his logbook that the ship appears to be traveling at only eight knots. The ship was going perhaps somewhat slower than um, had been anticipated um, and caused some comment on the bridge. Uh, Captain Martin asked Jackman, how fast do you think we're, we're making? It was difficult to tell. Shortly after midnight, Philip Jackman goes below decks to investigate. A mate from the engine room tells Jackman that Chief Engineer Reader has shut the engines in, reducing the number of revolutions per minute, effectively slowing the ship. Phil knew that the captain wasn't aware of this, and so the captain was under the impression that the ship was further advanced than she was. Perhaps not understanding the full significance of the news, Jackman decides not to tell Captain Martin what he has learned. Phil didn't report to the captain. Number one, because he was somewhat intimidated by the captain. And number two, he didn't want to get the engineers in trouble. Around 3 a.m., as the passengers sleep in their bunks, Two crew members report briefly sighting faint navigation lights in the direction of the coast. Captain Martin searches but cannot find any sign of the lights. He dismisses the sighting as a mistake. The Florizel has been at full throttle for more than six hours. Normally the ship steams to Cape Race in approximately four to five hours. The captain decides that the Florizel must be clear of the Newfoundland coast. The captain thought he was up around Cape Race. He wasn't. At 4 a.m., Captain Martin orders the change of course that will set them on a southwest heading to Halifax. Instead, the Florizel is now moving toward the Newfoundland coast on a collision course with disaster.
3 a.m. Sunday morning, February 24, 1918. The SS Florizel, with 138 passengers and crew, steams towards Halifax, Nova Scotia. Captain Martin, thinking that he has traveled south of the Newfoundland coast and is sailing in open ocean, has ordered the ship on a deadly course. As the crew on the bridge stare out into the storm, the ship suddenly lurches. The Florizel hits the jagged rocks of Horn Head, just off the Newfoundland coast. As the ship went onto the rocks, she rose up on the following waves and crashed uh, onto the rocks, impaling herself. There must have been a tremendous sound at that point of tearing metal. The waves were starting to break over the stern of the ship. Crew members hurry below deck to warn the passengers to put on their life vests and move to the lifeboat stations. Big waves were already causing damage all over the ship. The lifeboats were immediately destroyed. From the Marconi house, the location of the wireless, a desperate emergency message is sent. SOS Florizel ashore near Cape Race, fast going to pieces. The Marconi operator has no way of knowing that he has given the wrong position for the Florizel. John Munn dresses hurriedly and rushes to save his daughter Betty. Betty's nurse grabs her and together the three head for the deck. Alfred Moody, along with other crew members, hurries to find a safe place. They must all venture onto the deck. Devastating. Uh, the, the, the seas were very heavy. They were washing over the boat. There, were, there was nothing from the hold on to. They tried to run from one part of the ship that was not below water to another part where they could be more secure. As Alfred Moody struggles to hold on to the railing, a wave sweeps him into the ocean. The Florizel claims its first victim. Chief Engineer Reeder hurries from his quarters in search of other crew members. He is caught below decks by rushing water and drowns. A big wave came along and smashed the bridge and took away the bridge, the wheelhouse, and the cabin's captain's quarters underneath that in one go, killing 15 people. Captain Martin and Philip Jackman survive, but Jackman dislocates his shoulder and receives a terrible gash to his face, cutting him to the bone. The unconscious Jackman is dragged to the Marconi house. Below decks, water pours into the passenger compartments, leaving no escape for Greg Maloney until he finds a skylight. Maloney is helped up to the skylight by a fellow passenger. When he reaches the deck, Maloney looks back through the skylight. But the man who helped save his life is gone. He hadn't got much time to think as he had to run. He tried to save himself. Maloney makes his way to the Marconi house, where he finds a number of survivors packed into the small structure. With his daughter in his arms, John Munn struggles to find safety on the deck. A wave came along. The wave knocked the, the young Betty Mum out of the arms of her father, and she was washed overboard. A heartbroken John Munn made his way to the roof or the top of the smoking room. Along with other passengers, John Munn clings to a railing. Of course, this was a precarious place to be, perhaps the worst place in many respects. And as every big wave came over the uh, the back of the ship, uh, then there were fewer people standing there. A large wave hits John Munn as he hangs on and knocks him into the sea. More than 30 survivors, including Betty Munn's nurse, managed to reach safety, huddling together in the Marconi house. Meanwhile, in St. John's, word of the Florizel's distress call has been received, and ships are being readied for a rescue. Along with many others, Pat McCarthy arrives to help with the rescue effort. Although the Florizel is only 250 yards offshore, the storm makes it impossible to launch a rescue from the beach. They were just dying to get aboard their doors and go out and, and do something, you know. They had to, to wait until the, the seas died down a bit. Rescue vessels begin arriving at dusk on Sunday evening, 
but rough seas prevent them from getting close to the Florizel. At 1 a.m., aboard the SS Prospero, Chief Engineer James McKinley enlists a rescue party. My father said, well, call for volunteers and I'll be the first to go. And so all his men followed him. They rowed then, yes. They had to row out in the storm and the wind. The rough seas capsized the rescue boat several times, and they cannot get close enough to the Florizel to secure a line to the deck. Exhausted, they return to the Prospero, vowing to attempt another rescue when seas are calm. In the Marconi house on the Florizel, the survivors can do nothing but wait. Some people really, you know, panicky. A few of them, he said, well, you know, trying to cheer up the rest of them, you know. They were thinking, just keeping up their hopes, waiting for the seas to calm down, for the rest of the boat to get in. Early morning, Monday, February 25th, 1918. Grounded on the rocks of Horn Head, the wounded Florizel survives the brutal onslaught of the sea. Most of the survivors cling to hope and each other in the ship's Marconi house. The storm relents just before dawn. Although still extremely dangerous, it is now possible to approach the wreck with small rescue boats. Aboard the Terra Nova, Captain Nicholas Kennedy and two naval reservists board a rescue craft in the early morning darkness and row to the Florizel. There were only a very, very short distance when a, a large wave hit the, hit the uh, dory and upset it. And they managed to get back, get the boat right and back, back in again. And the same thing happened again. Fighting the winds and sea, several boats make their way toward the Florizel. Rescuers manage to secure a line to the bow of the ship. The survivors cross the swaying deck toward the rescue boats. The heaving seas nearly drown Greg Maloney as he attempts to leave the ship. Under the seas torn, he jumped, they missed the door, they went down <laughs> in the water, and they hung them into the door in it. Rescuers work through the day and into the night. Captain Martin is the last person to leave the wreck of the Florizel alive. Survivors of the Florizel are brought back to St. John's. Philip Jackman survives, but carries a constant reminder of his experience. Poor fellow, he had a, you know, he had a frightful scar, and the scar ran from his, the top of his nose down across his lip and across his chin. Alfred Moody's wife Lillian receives sorrowful news. Her husband did not survive. My grandmother was totally devastated. Uh, her whole life had been built around her marriage and her husband and her children. The plans had been made to move to England. The drowning of her husband, it just totally, uh, totally changed her life. And she was devastated for a period of time. Of the 138 people who left on the Florizel, only 44 survive, 17 passengers and 27 crew. 94 men, women, and children die. On March 5th, 1918, a Marine inquiry convenes in order to determine the cause of the Florizel disaster. The inquiry grapples with one important question. Why did the Florizel run aground 12 miles short of Cape Race. They traveled not far enough to make the turn around Cape Race and ended up on the shore. The speed was overestimated and the position of the ship wasn't understood. This was the finding of the inquiry afterwards. But essentially the problem lay in the fact that the ship wasn't going fast enough. Captain Martin is held responsible for the navigational error that caused the wreck of the Florizel. He moved away and moved to New York. He ended up his days as port captain in, uh, in New York, but he died in 1939. Changes come into effect as a result of the Florizel accident. Ships are better equipped, and eventually radar plays an important role in marine navigation. 
Of course, some of the other uh, inquiry recommendations were that the navigational lights were improved along the coast. For those marked by the disaster of the Florizel, life changes forever. He carried those scars to his, to his death. He always blamed himself for the, not informing the captain of knowledge that he had. So, to his dying day, Phil Jackman bore the burden of the ship going ashore when she did. The stories that got passed on uh, were basically, uh, initially, stories of, of hardship. My, my grandmother was totally devastated. Uh, her whole life had been built around her marriage and her husband and her children. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, the, the rug was pulled out from under her feet. Today, a public memorial honors the people who lost their lives on the Florizel. The grandparents put a monument in Boring Park of Peter Pan, which is a remembrance of uh, Betty Munn. 